So the discussion was on juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma. Through last four parts, uh, I explained the theories of angiofibroma, again the spread of angiofibroma, then histopathology and clinical features and also investigations used in case of juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma. So in this class, I will explain how to stage angiofibroma and also what are the treatment modalities used in uh, juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma. Okay, staging. There are so many named uh, systems for staging, like session staging in 1981. Uh, while explaining the theories of origin of JNA, we saw so many theories every year, year-wise. Like that, there are also different staging system. Session staging is there, Chandler's in 1984, then Fish staging, then Radkowski staging and uh, University of Pittsburgh Medical System uh, by Sniderman in uh, 2010. So of this, this fish staging is most robust and practical for uh, staging of GNA. So uh, I'll explain what is fish staging and even the Scott uh, Brown textbooks uh, is um, telling that fish staging is a uh, most robust and practical system. Okay, so we will see what is fish staging. Fish has four stages. Stage one is, there are four stages. The stage one is the tumor is limited to nasopharyngeal cavity with negligible bone erosion or bone destruction is negligible or if at all there is bone uh, erosion it is limited to spinobaltine foramen. The site of origin of JNA as I already told it is spinobaltine foramen. So in stage 1 this tumor is limited to nasopharyngeal cavity with negligible bone erosion. Bone erosion negligible. Or if at all it is limited to spinopalatine forearm. Okay, it is stage 1. So the tumor limited to nasopharyngeal cavity with negligible bone erosion or limited bone erosion of the spinopalatine forearm. It is stage 1. Stage 2 of fish uh, staging of JNA. Stage 2 is the tumor extending into pterygopalatine fossa. So from the spinopalatine foramen it is going to pterygopalatine fossa or it is going to uh, sinuses. Which all sinuses? It can be either the maxillary or it can be the ethmoid or it can be the spinoid. It is not going to the frontal. Remember that. So either it is limited to PPF or it is going to sinuses like maxillary ethmoid or spinoid with a limited bone erosion. Okay. There is bone erosion but it is limited. Okay. So stage 2 is the tumor invading the pterygopalatine fossa or sinuses like maxillary, ethmoid or uh, spinoid with limited bone erosion. Okay. And then stage 3. In stage 3, this can go from pterygopalatine fossa, it can go to the infratemporal fossa or it can go to the orbit. Okay. So in stage 3, the tumor is extending to infratemporal fossa or into the orbit. And again, this is divided into A and B. A is without intracranial involvement. B is there is intracranial involvement but it is extradural, intracranial extradural or paracellar. Okay. So in A it is going to infratemporal fossa or to the orbital region. Okay, so in stage 3, the involvement of infratemporal fossa or the orbital region 
and A without intracranial involvement or B is with intracranial but extra dural or paracellular involvement. Okay. See in 3 there is uh, intracranial extra dural. When it becomes intracranial intradural. Okay, intracranial intra uh, dural involvement that becomes 4. 4 is again divided into 4A and 4B. That is depending upon involvement of three structures. What are they? One is cavernous sinus. Okay. Then second is optic asthma. And the third is pituitary fossa. Okay. No infiltration of these three. Cavernous sinus, optic asthma and pituitary fossa is not involved. It becomes 4A. And if there is involvement of either of these three, it becomes 4B. Okay. So negative for this it is 4A. And positive for this involvement of any of these become 4B. But there is intracranial intradural involvement. Okay. So, you have to remember session, uh, fifth staging. Okay. So, one is uh, tumor limited to the nasopharynx with the negligible bone erosion or there is bone erosion of the spinopalatine foramen. Then stage 2 is involvement of pterygopalatine fossa or maxillary ethmoid or spinoid sinuses with limited bone erosion. And stage 3 is there is... Um, Involvement of infratemporal fossa or orbital fossa and A is without intracranial involvement and B is intracranial extradural involvement. And in stage 4 there is intracranial intradural involvement and if there is involvement of cavernous sinus, optic asthma or pituitary fossa it becomes 4B and if there is no involvement it becomes 4A. So these are the 4 stages. There are also so many other named stages. Uh, um, staging system but you should be thorough with at least this uh, fifth staging you should be thorough with the fifth staging okay the treatment can be broadly divided into uh, surgical uh, approaches and non-surgical treatment okay so surgical and non-surgical adjuvant therapy In surgical, it can again divide that into open uh, approaches and also endoscopic approach. Open and endoscopic. And in the non-surgical adjuvant therapy, we have uh, embolization. Mainly used in the preoperative phase. Then uh, hormonal or chemotherapy and also radiotherapy and a combination of all these. Okay. And the surgical excision is a mainstay of treatment of juvenile esophageal angiofibroma and uh, preoperative embolization or hormonal therapy RT. All these can be used either preoperative or in cases where surgery is contraindicated due to any reasons. And uh, coming to the open approaches, there are so many uh, approaches surgery for uh, surgical excision of angiofibroma and mainly the transpalatal or different types of maxillectomy or infratemporal force approaches, um, uh, um, uh, craniofacial resections etc. That I explain after uh, describing all other uh, treatment modalities. Okay. Now, the endoscopic excision of juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma. The endoscopic approach has got so many advantages. The main advantages are better illumination and magnification, then lower mobility, shorter duration of hospital stay which in turn leads to cost saving and also as there is no visible scar, the cosmetic appeal or advantage is also there. 
and uh, uh, nowadays or the recent times the image guided endoscopic laser assisted removal is also uh, getting uh, or it is becoming a fast growing uh, technique through endoscopy. Okay, the image guided endoscopic laser assisted removal of JNA. And uh, coming to the surgical considerations of uh, or endoscopic surgical considerations of JNA, that is important. Uh, the approach of endoscopic surgery depends upon the tumor size and extent. While discussing on investigations, I, I explained the need of identifying the feeding vessel. Uh, if the feeding vessel is coming posteriorly, which is very difficult to visualize through endoscope, it is better go for an uh, open approach. And like that, the tumor extent and also the tumor size dep also depend upon the approach for an endoscopic excision also. Uh, for example, if the tumor is uh, small, we can go through the endonasal approach. So, in the surgical considerations, the first one is small tumors. For small tumors, we can go through an endoscopic endonasal approach. And if it is tumor size is large, uh, medium to large, either an endoscopic dangle or a sterman and canfield approach. Large size tumors, we need more extensive transsteroid approaches also. Temporary extension was a contraindication for endoscopic approach. But nowadays, this uh, intracranial extension is not at all a contraindication. An extended anterior skull base approach through extended anterior skull base approach, even the intracranial extension can be uh, excised endoscopically. Okay, so these are the various endoscopic approaches. And the most important thing is that adequate exposure of the tumor is needed. And in the endoscopic approach, the most important thing is adequate exposure of the tumor. So, adequate exposure of the tumor is needed. That is to uh, find out the exact tumor size, uh, extent of the tumor. And uh, second, to find out the localization of the feeder vessel and also the relation of this tumor with the, uh, relay, uh, the neighboring vital structures. So, the important one, adequate exposure of the tumor in order to find out the exact tumor limit, then to find out the localization or the um, site of the feeding vessel and also the relation of the tumor with the neighboring vital structures. So, for all these three, you need a uh, adequate exposure. Then the second one, so I write it here, the important one, exposure. Then the second, I get the feeding vessel. After adequate exposure of the tumor, identify and ligate the feeding vessel. That is important. And do a posterior septectomy. Okay. Posterior part, end of the septum has to be removed. Posterior septectomy. For what? This will increase the access to the tumor. Okay, that area uh, access will be improved by doing a posterior septectomy. And also, you carry the dissection along the pseudo capsule. If you go and catch the tumor itself, there will be uh, excessive bleeding. So, go along the pseudo capsule from uh, lateral to medial direction. Always along the pseudo capsule from lateral to medial. Okay, so adequate exposure. I already told you the three reasons for adequate exposure. Then ligate the feeding vessel first. Do a posterior septectomy to improve, increase the access to the tumor. And also always dissect along the pseudo capsule from lateral to medial direction. Now, uh, for larger tumors, you can opt a four handed technique that is, the two hands of surgeon and also the two hands of the assistant for keep, uh, so that the surgeon can hold uh, the endoscope with one hand and the debrider or uh, whatever the other instrument for um, elevation or excision, you can use other uh, instrument the, on the other hand and with the assistance hand, either holding the suction or cautery, whatever it is needed. So, for larger tumors, 
you go with a four handed technique okay whatever the surgeon uh, is comfortable and for uh, extensive tumors large tumors with extensive lateral extension into infratemporal fossa or the parapharyngeal space the four port brados technique is a uh, suggested option okay four port brados technique Another important thing to remember is to drill the uh, pterygoid base at the end of the procedure so that you can minimize the recurrence of JNA. Okay, seventh one, drilling the pterygoid base at the end of procedure. That is also very important. Okay, pterygoid base. Another important thing is that the access to a blood bank should be there. From the operating room, the, there should be access to the blood bank and also the operating room should have adequate availability of hemostatic materials like, uh, what are the hemostatic materials? Surgicel or um, Flosin or a TC. Okay. These are all uh, hemostatic materials. So adequate availability of any of these should be there and also blood bank should be uh, accessible from the operating room. You can also use a coablator. Okay, coablator. And this coablation is a plasma based device which causes surface coagulation of the tumor without causing any uh, collateral thermal damage. So that this will shrink the tumor size and reduces the intraoperative uh, blood loss. Okay. And you also, you have to discuss the NA procedure with the patient and in the consent, you have to take uh, consent for converting this endoscopic approach to open approach at any time during the surgery. That is also very need, uh, highly needed. So informed consent uh, should be taken for conversion of this endoscopic approach to open approach at any point of time during surgery, right? So all these are needed. These are all surgical considerations. That is adequate exposure of the tumor. Then uh, ligate the feeding vessel first. Do a posterior septectomy to increase the access to the tumor. Dissect along the pseudo capsule from lateral to medial side. If for larger tumor, you can go for a four-handed technique. And if the larger tumor with extensive lateral extension into the intra or uh, intratemporal space or into the parapharyngeal space, you can go for a four pot Brados technique. And at the end of the procedure, go for drilling of the geroid base. And the operating room should have adequate hemostatic material, access to the blood bank, and also coablator if needed. And the in the informed consent, remember to take the consent for converting endoscopic approach to an open approach whenever needed. A surgeon with a very good expertise in endoscopy surgery and also uh, with adequate supply of instruments. There are only a very few contraindications for endoscopic uh, removal of JNA. These are the contraindications. only one, two and three. That is broad skull base infiltration. Infiltration of skull base or also brain infiltration is a contraindication and uh, internal carotid artery, extensive blood supply from internal carotid artery or encasement of internal carotid artery by tumor is again a contraindication for endoscopic removal. Okay. And with uh, more uh, expertise and more instruments and more uh, surgeon with a vascular sur uh, surgeon and skull base surgeon even this will become no more a contraindication in future. So for the present day you have to remember these uh, contraindications for endoscopic removal of JNA.